<laughs> hey, welcome to church. Any men in the house this morning? Come on, man. Ooh. We had a wonderful, wonderful time at our men's camp. And I asked a bunch of wives on the way in, do you want refund? Because I said, if, if your husband came back just the same, you get a refund. And so the offer's still open. If your husband came back the same, you can go get a refund at the back. Uh, but we'll just show your face next week and your husband's face. We had a great time. Uh, I, I'm still processing what happened on the weekend. And th there was a moment where we were in, in the, this little hot room, about 250 men in there sweating, and all the young ones with their body odor, and, uh, <laughs> and Pastor Rocky standing next to me, and, and Rocky like leans in, he's like, James. I'm like, Batman? Is that you? <laughs> it feels like Batman's talking to you sometimes when Rocky's talking. He's like, there's just something about hearing the the men. And I was like, yeah. And then I listened, and I was like, oh, yeah. The man began to sing, and they began to worship. And it was amazing. There, there was this one moment where there was a, a roar came out. Um, and, and, you know, they, they used what I said, but my God, if we could get those 250 men to stand up and to be men. You know, I, I said this on the weekend, the nation needs a strong church. And a strong church needs strong men. You know, in our church, in our church, we have, in our, our, our gender demographic, we have 65% women and 35% men, uh, which is actually very uh, normal here in the Philippines to have a split uh, like that. And so we need that 35% to stand up and be strong leaders, leaders in their house, leaders in this nation, leaders in this church. And so it was really good. It was just really fun. It was really good. Um, also, I hit a game winner uh, late. Do we have that video, actually, of me hitting? <laughs> we should have. I was waiting for it on the recap, and voila. So, Cy Young Miles, no bonus this year. So, welcome to one of the most divisive weeks in our nation's recent history. How many of all have just had a great week full of joy this week because of how amazing everything is in the Philippines, huh? I, uh, I was gonna preach about shame this week because I talked about it a couple weeks ago and kind of preach a little bit more on it. And then on Thursday, after spending a few days online, the cesspool of the internet, I decided that I was going to switch my sermon and I was gonna do what every good pastor in the Philippines today should be doing, and that's speaking into our nation and what's gone on this week. And so the title of my message today is this, how to love someone that you disagree with. So, I'm not going to talk around the election. I'm not going to talk in innuendos. You don't have to read between the lines today. Just read the lines. I'm going to talk. I'm going to mention uh, incoming president, Bong Bong Marcos. I'm going to mention uh, other candidates who lost, like uh, Lenny and like Pacquiao, uh, who I love personally. I think he's awesome. I just he fight for our nation, but sayang. Uh, third place lung. So, and I'm going to make a few jokes to make you all laugh a little bit, because some of you all need to laugh. But you know what else I'm not going to do? I'm not going to Christian gaslight you either. So I'm not going to say, hey, just pray, God's sovereign, everything's going to be okay. Because in your world, it might not be okay. And that might have nothing to do with the president. It might have everything to do with what you're going through this week. There was an election. Some won, some lost. But there's still people dying. There's still people who are struggling financially. There's still people going through relationship issues that have nothing to do with the presidential race. And so even though I'm going to talk about it pretty openly today, this sermon, and especially for those watching online that you're not in the Philippines and you don't care 
at all about our local government, which is totally fine. There's still principles in here that will help you in your everyday life deal with people and get along with people and love people that you disagree with. I don't want to center around your disagreements with a candidate that the majority of you have zero relationship with and don't know, but I want to center around the disagreement with those that you have in your everyday world, those that are around you, those that voted something different. You know, the world hasn't ended. Jesus is still on the throne. And in this nation, and I say this with sadness, but the reality is whoever wins the presidency, corruption isn't going away anytime soon. Corruption is a poison that has been embedded into the very foundation of this nation and will take years to eradicate And do you know how this poison of corruption will end? Not by you voting for a candidate, but by you, the individual Filipino or foreigner, whoever you are in this nation, stopping paying bribes, stopping cheating people. I've seen passionate people, passionate about their candidate, crying because their candidate lost, yet they'll pay a bribe. Oh, now I'm starting. And so today, I don't want to talk about your disagreement with a candidate. I'm not going to go into policies today, but I'm going to talk about people around us that we disagree with. What I've seen in the last few months, which has blown up this week, is that most of the disagreements that we're having with people are either on group chats or online, right? Let's just call it out what it is. A lot of the disagreements we have are not actually person to person like normal human beings. They're online. They're in group chats. They're on your social media. Relationships are literally being ended through digital means without any face-to-face confrontation. Families have been split apart. Decade-long relationships have been thrown away through a GC on Viber. Viber has done more to tear apart the families in this nation And you know what's sad is that this is happening with Christians. Today, we're in church. I'm going to talk to Christians. If you don't profess to follow Jesus, if you're here for the first time, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I'm going to preach today. But you're not held up to a standard of living that Christians are. Christians, if you profess to follow Christ, there is a standard by which we must live if we want to call ourselves Christians. It's not a standard of perfection, but it is a standard. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. The writer here of Hebrews, it encourages us to make every effort to live in peace. Every effort to live with those around us. And while we're doing it as well, hey, let's just throw in holiness to be safe. So do we get this right all the time? Absolutely not. There are many times that I don't live in peace with other people. There are many times I have disagreements, but there is a difference between attempting this, failing at it, but trying again, and those that just give up altogether. There is a difference. And the reality is that in the last 20 20 years, I think that the the world has gotten just a little bit crazier thanks to the internet. Some of y'all don't even remember what life was like 20 years ago before the internet. I'm telling you, there was still bad things happening. There were still bad people, but it was just a little simpler. If someone had a different opinion than you 20 years ago, it had to come up in conversation face to face for it to become a sticking point in your relationship. You know, I heard a quote the other day that I thought this was a powerful quote in regards to social media, and it said this, we weren't designed to handle this many opinions at once. And I thought about it, and again, I'm I'm in that generation. Uh, What am I? What, What millennial am I? What, what are we? We're, no, we're not, I am not a millennial. Don't you dare put that on me. 
I'm the one above it. Am I the one above it? Am I a millennial? <laughs> yeah. Well, we're in the, but we're the good millennials. Yeah, we're the good ones. No, no. I think it was I think it was people born between 1978 and 1986 or something or 80 something like that. We are old enough to remember life before the internet, but young enough to not be freaked out by the internet, right? We are, in, we are in this great, for all those that I just said, between 78 and 86, we are the chosen generation to link, to link the old with the young. We are the linkers. We are, right? We're the linkers. We understand. We know what a rotary phone is. You hand that to one of these young Gen J's, whatever they are. What's the new Gen? Gen Z, Gen B, A, whatever it is. They look a rotary phone, they don't know what it is. It's like a caveman, right? They wouldn't know what to do with it, right? So we're, we're old enough to understand, but we're, we're young enough to get it as well. But I remember what life was like. Do you, for those of you that remember what life was like before internet, do you know how many opinions we got in a day? Generally only one or two at night. We go home, turn on the TV, and then one person would give us their opinion, or at best, two people would argue. If you were lucky and you were married three when you went to bed, your wife would give you her opinion about you and everything wrong with you as well. Was Pastor Rocky told me to say that. But, <laughs> but generally, it was two. And they were from experts. Experts. Now, with one flick of your thumb, you could, just one flick gives you 20 different opinions given by people that read one article once all the way over here. Do you know how many people have gone from climate change experts to COVID experts to Ukraine war experts to NBA finals experts? UAAP experts, UP, congratulations, UP. People from UP this week, they didn't know whether to be happy or angry all in one week. See, I can make jokes, it's okay. Social media has given people platforms and influences that they never earn. Some of us listen to people that in the real world are absolute morons. Yet because they have a blue tick by their name, we think that they know what they're talking about. Social media has created a disconnect between our online persona and our real world persons. And COVID unfortunately made this gap even bigger because we all stayed at home online. And a lot of us didn't even go out and see people for a long time. Unfortunately for everyone, your online persona and your social media interaction actually has real world consequences. We just don't get confronted by it in the same way. Let me give you an example between the real world and between online media. Some of the stuff we say online, it, it would be stupid if we said it in the real world. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if I walk down here next to my friend Rinka? Love Rinka. But imagine if Rinka voted for someone that I didn't vote for. Let me, let, me, let me tell you a couple of the online things that I've read this week, if it was done in real person. Ready? Some of y'all are getting a little bit worried. <laughs> like, it's weird. Have you ever thought about this, how different online and real world is? Like, when we take a selfie, do you know what we would have done if we'd taken a selfie 20 years ago? Taken a photo, printed it, photocopied on big pieces of paper, and stuck it all around the room, right? That's what a selfie is. This, this is some of the things I've, I've heard. Unfriend me if you want. <laughs> Could you ever imagine going up to someone in real life? Unfriend me. <laughs> you don't care about this country like I do. Yeah, now some of y'all are getting a little bit nervous, right? Because you realize <laughs> your online world is actually real. People are getting fired from jobs because of tweets they tweeted 12 years ago. 
the online world is here. And sometimes we try and do this disconnect. And this whole sermon is not about online, but let's face it, this week online. This is where a lot of the toxicness has come from this week is people online. And I'm not having to go at you if you said that. Believe me, I'm not preaching about you. Oh, my God, he read me. He read what I said. He's preaching about me. No, I'm not preaching about you. I'm preaching about everybody. But if you're convicted, <laughs> social media, it allows a disconnect from reality, but it has real world consequences. And here's the thing. Even though it may seem disconnected from reality because you're sitting in your room by yourself fervently typing on that keyboard like the warrior you are, it actually has a real world consequence. And being a follower of Christ, let me tell you, being a follower of Christ must be reflected in your online persona as much as it is in your offline. It is. It's not like you get online with your fake troll name and Jesus doesn't know who you are. My God, who is angry citizen 1924? Wow, who is it? Holy Spirit, do you know who it is? No, I don't. They didn't put their profile photo up. I don't know who it is. So how can I love someone that I disagree with? Specifically this week, how can I love someone that voted differently to me and maybe doesn't share the same conviction I have? Let me set up today with this one verse, and if I only used this one verse today, it would be good enough. If all you get from today is this one verse, let it be good enough for you because 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 says this, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, love always perseveres. Uh, if you find yourself doing anything opposite to what I just read out, then you're not operating in love. Therefore, you as a Christ follower, follower are not giving to other people that which you so freely have received from Jesus. Now, is it easy to love people? Is it easy to love someone that disagrees with you? Heck no. It's very, very difficult. That's why I'm preaching about it today. So I want to dive in. I got four thoughts. Then we're going to pray. And then some of y'all need to hug people. Number one is this. How are we going to love someone that we disagree with? We need to learn how to listen to one another. James chapter 1, verse 19, it says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Um, my question to you is, do you really listen? Like, really listen? You're like, yeah, of course I listen. <laughs> no. I mean really listen, like Really listen to understand why that person believes something that you don't. Uh, not listening to debate, but listening to learn. There's a big difference. I, I love debate in, in school. I love debate. I've always loved public speaking. It's always come natural to me. I like it. I like to debate. And I always, I never liked being the first up debater, right? The first, if you've ever debated, the first debater just got to get up there, give all the information. I didn't like that because you had to prepare a lot for that beforehand. And I was very lazy in school. So I always liked being the third debater at the end because the majority of my stuff was listening to what they were saying and just using their information against them, right? It's wonderful for some one that didn't want to do a lot of pre-work in my, in my school. And so I would love it. And as they would be debating, I would be listening not to learn. I couldn't give a crap what they said. I wasn't, I was against them. I wasn't listening to learn. I was listening in such a way that I could formulate my own argument against them and use their words to trap them. I know when I'm talking to people and they're listening to learn, and I know when I'm talking to people and they're listening just so that they can debate back, and then I know when I'm talking to people that aren't listening and they're just thinking of the next thing that they're going to say. Me and my wife. Sometimes we have disagreements. Does anybody else married have a disagreement? 
You, you may call it fighting. We call it love conversations, <laughs> right? So we'll, we'll, we'll go, and when Kate gets heated, oh, man, I've talked about this before. I asked her permission if I could share this, and she said, yes, totally, say whatever you want about me. And so uh, we, have, we have arguments, right, sometimes, and she'll just get so prideful, right? She will just be like, and I know when she, it's like the steam is coming out of her ears, and I'm talking, and, and I know when she's gotten to the point where she's not listening, she's just formulating the next thing she's going to say. Come on now, any married people know what I'm talking about? Any married, are you all nervous right now? Some of y'all, all the husbands are like this. You know what I'm talking about? I can see, I'm dropping revelation bombs from heaven. And she starts pacing. When, when Kate starts pacing, I know I could freaking be Jesus in the room talking about the kingdom of God. And she'd be like, I don't want to hear what you have to say. You, you get what I'm saying? So, so here's the thing. You want to learn how to love someone that you disagree with? Could I challenge you? Listen. I've seen posts this week, people saying, who you voted for reflects who you are as a person, right? Like, that's pretty mean. Like, a lot of people voted for Bong Bong. That's pretty mean. There's a lot of people in our church that voted for Bong Bong. There's a lot of people in our church that voted for Lenny. There's a lot of people in our church that voted for Manny. I love you, Manny Pacquiao. <laughs> Could I say, instead of, making, instead of making absolutely horrendous, stupid statements like that, sit down with someone that voted differently to you and actually listen. They might have a reason that you didn't think of. It still might be wrong, but at least as a Christ follower, you are learning to listen and at least understand their side because the Bible tells you to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Some of y'all got the quickest thumbs in the world. If the Bible was written today, it would be slow to type and quick to read. Proverbs 18, 13, it says this, to answer before listening, that is folly and shame. Can I encourage you? Sit with someone. Say something like this. Ready? Help me understand why you believe what you believe and why you did what you did. And can I encourage you? Actually mean that. Don't just say it as a throwaway comment thinking about how you're going to come back with your argument. Sit with someone. Love. You may still disagree with them. I'm not saying you got to agree with everything. I agree with so many. I disagree with so many people. So many. Politically, I disagree with people. I am 100% right-leaning in my political beliefs. 100%. I don't push that on you as our church, but it comes out in who I am. I'm 100% right. I, I disagree with people all the time over politics. Uh, but as a Christ follower, I'm called to listen. And not just so that I can argue back, but so that I can listen and understand. I may still disagree, but it's a great starting place. Number two, how can we love someone we disagree with? Be humble. Philippians 2 verse 3, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Humility is shown by the willingness to acknowledge that we aren't always right, and there might actually be a better way. We can only learn from others when we have enough respect for them and when we consider what they have to say. In other words, kind of a biblical thought when we value them above ourselves. Humility challenges us to find the common ground to connect with instead of the common ground to fight about. You might be right, but you also might be wrong. 
and humility acknowledges that there's even a 1% chance of being wrong. And what humility does is it shapes how we say things. Humility may not change what you say, but it should change how you say it. Please, listen to me, please do not give Jesus a bad name by being grossly rude and arrogant online and then taking a picture that you were at church. You give us all a bad name. Please, I'm begging you as a fellow Christ follower. I hate meeting people and they go, oh, all you Christians are the same. I'm like, no, no we're not. There are some absolute weirdos in our camp. Ah. Humility may not change what you say, but it definitely changes how you say it. Changes how you say it. You know, people have been asking me. I had a great conversation yesterday, actually, over lunch. One of the young guys, he asked me, uh, Pastor, should, should Christians be activists? Is it Christian to be an activist? Can I go to a rally? Can it be an activist? And I thought about it, and, you know, I really believe that as Christ followers, the Bible has commanded us to stand up for truth and justice. We should stand up for those who are weaker. Yes, we should. But how we stand up, how we stand against, will determine if we will influence people with the gospel or not. Remember, our activism, our activism and our stand for justice should always be tied to the gospel. If you can't see Jesus in your activism, then you're not doing it for his glory. We feed the poor, not to feed the poor and be good, but we feed the poor because Jesus told us to, and it gives us a way in to share the gospel. My goal is not to make someone feel fatter on their way to hell. My goal is to feed someone so that I can share with them something that will, will let them never go hungry, give them a drink that they'll never go thirsty. And so when it comes to my activism, when it comes to standing up for truth and social justice and act, all that kind of stuff, I want to tell you, you can do it, but do it in a way that Jesus would be glorified and that Jesus would be happy with. And for some of you that are like, yes, well, Jesus was there for the weaker people and Jesus would stood up. Jesus stood up against the leaders. Ah, ah, read your Bible. Jesus stood up against the religious leaders, not the political ones. Listen to me. Hey, listen to me. I'm saying stand up and be an activist, but maybe don't throw Jesus' name in there. You know the only time Jesus addressed the government? was when he said, give to Caesars what is Caesar. Do you realize why the Israelites had such a hard time getting their heads around Jesus being their Messiah and their Savior? Because at the time that Jesus walked, Israel was under oppression by Roman rule. They were oppressed, and they were expecting the Messiah to be in the line of King David, a Savior that would ride in on a white horse with a sword in his hand and would rescue them from the Romans. And do you know all Jesus did was say, give to your oppressor what is his and give me a donkey so that I can ride in. Jesus wasn't there to save them from their political oppression. He was there to save them from their eternal oppression from the enemy. Well, Jesus would walk the streets. I don't, I don't know if he would or if he wouldn't. I don't know, but I definitely don't think you have the right to claim 100% that he would. Is there evil going on? Stand against it. Yes. If there's injustice, stand against it, yes. But do it in a way that draws people to Jesus, not just to your good idea. One of the issues that I saw happening in the last few months on every side of the political spectrum was that Christians, no, I don't, this sermon, I'm not even talking about unchurched people, Christians. Christians were talking about their candidate like it was the second coming of Christ <laughs> on all sides. 
like their candidate was going to save this nation. Are you kidding me? Don't you dare ever put the responsibility that Jesus carries on a human being. One person will never change this nation. Jesus will change this nation. You know how he'll change it? Through his church. I, I, I'm amazed with all these political rallies that happen. 700,000, 1 million, 30 billion, you know, all the things. Wouldn't it be cool if the church could actually have some rallies down the middle of Ayala, down the middle of Ortigas, out in whatever? Wouldn't it be great if we could actually come around someone that we could all celebrate that won't let us down? Let our humility build bridges with others, not destroy them. Be humble. You doing okay? Okay. How can I love someone I disagree with? My third thought is this. You got to understand that they may be brokenhearted. Psalm 34, verse 18, it says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. If you're brokenhearted this week, that is okay. Process it, grieve it, do what you need to do. But my Bible tells me that the Lord is close to you and that he will save you even if your spirit is crushed. I found in life that generally the people that annoy me the most come out of a place of brokenness in their life. Like there are those whose stories that I don't know and how they act a certain way because of things that were done to them. And, and I don't know what's been done, but there's generally always a reason why people act out. There's generally a brokenness there. There are others that are just broken because of what life has thrown at them. And I want to encourage you that there are situations as Christ followers where we just need to simply be present and with those who are hurting, even if we cannot fully understand their pain. This might make us uncomfortable, especially if the pain seems to come from a vastly different point of view than ours. But if we are to be Christ-like in our love, our hearts should break with theirs. I have sat with people, and I have sat and loved them because I know their pain, but I've sat with others and just been present, and I don't understand their pain, but I've just been there. I, I've had a couple of significant deaths in my life. My best friend died in front of me on a basketball court when I was 17. My grandfather, a godly man, who was the only person I only grandfather I really had and knew, uh, died in my early 20s. Uh, and then I was married for nine weeks uh, years ago, and, and my wife passed away after nine weeks. So I can sit with people that have lost friends, and I can put my arm around and say, I know what you're going through. I can empathize with them. People that have lost grandparents, I know what you're going through. Uh, during COVID, when people lost people, they weren't allowed to be there. My grandmother, who I love with all my heart, died during COVID. And I wasn't allowed to travel to be there because of all these ridiculously sh stupid restrictions. And uh, sorry, I just got to throw that in there. And so I know what it's like. When someone loses a spouse, man, I can sit, put my arm around you. But if someone's lost a child, I don't know what that feels like. But I can sit and be present. And I can sit and I can love. And I can understand that even though I may not know exactly what you're going through, and even though I may not fully understand the pain that you're experiencing, I can at least sit with you. And the peace of God that is on my life, because I'm a Christ follower, that peace can come into our room. Being with the broken hearted helps us to empathize with their struggles. And understanding what they are experiencing can lead to compassion for them. Oh, compassion. Isn't that a Christian word that we hate to use when we're angry with someone. We don't want to be compassionate towards what you're going through. We want to hate you. We want to be angry. Come on now. We want to be angry with you. We want to put Jesus aside for a few weeks so that I can deal with what I'm dealing with. The problem is you put Jesus aside and you ain't going to deal with what you're dealing with. It's just going to grow and grow and grow because you need Jesus to actually come in the midst of what you're dealing with. There are those who this week are genuinely heartbroken because of what has happened. 
And if you are not heartbroken, I want to encourage you. Show love to those who are. Maybe sit and listen to them why they are heartbroken. And listen to listen. Don't listen to argue, but listen to listen. I've learned this lesson so well from my wife. When I was younger, I'm a man. And so as a man, I like to fix things, right? I want to fix things. I want to fix everything. Unless it's things around my house. I want to pay someone else to fix the things around my house, but I still want to fix them. I just pay someone else to do it, but I want to fix things. So Kate would come to me as, as a wife with problems, problems that she's facing that day and early on in our marriage. And when I say early on, maybe the first 12 years of our marriage. Earlier, earlier in our marriage, the first 12, we've been married 14 years. So the first 12 years earlier on in our marriage, I would want to fix everything. She would come in, oh, I'm like, babe, it's okay. I'm here, leader, uh, leader, headship. I'm the man, right? If you do this, 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 your problem will be solved. And she'd look at me like. <laughs> and she would say this phrase many times, many times. Took me 12 years to hear it. Many times. I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to listen. And as she would say it in my head, I, I wouldn't hear it because I was already trying to fix what her, your issue is that you're prideful. You won't help, let me fix it for you because you've got so much pride. No, no, that. But a couple years ago, something began to click and I, and I kind of realized, yeah, maybe I just need to shut up. Maybe I just need to sit there and I need to listen. And I've gotten a lot better at this. And now we have conversations where I'll sit there and I will listen and listen and listen <laughs> and listen. And I've gotten real good. Yeah. Yeah. You remember, remember old school when we used to do this? Boyfriends on the phone with the girlfriends, right? Yeah. No way. Talaga. <laughs> but I, I actually stopped listening. And, and our relationship, honestly, has actually gotten a lot better because now I'm not like, you know, looking at our marriage like it's a, a Lego construction that I've got to fix every time there's a problem. Sometimes Kate, as my wife, she just wants me to shut up and listen and just be with her and not try and fix it in that moment. This week, there are people who are heartbroken. Your candidate may have lost. Can I remind you that there was more than two candidates? Your candidate may have lost, whether it was presidential, mayor, governor, whatever it is, Congress, Senate, whatever, your candidate might have lost. So if your candidate won this week, could I encourage you, just for a moment, just shut up and just listen and be humble and sit with the brokenhearted and love the brokenhearted. So how do I love someone I disagree with? Well, my last point, and it's pretty obvious this point, but it's simply this. We need to follow the example of Jesus. Jesus prayed for his enemies. Oh, we hate, we hate, we hate this point. Even I struggle with this point because there are people in my life that annoy me. They annoy me. They annoy me. None of them go to our church, but they annoy me, right? Does anyone, just be honest. Is there anyone in your life that just annoys you right now? Lift up your hand right now. I want to be honest. Jesus is watching, right? Keep your hands raised if they're sitting next to you right now. If you're... <laughs> but some bold people. Wow, some stupid husbands. Good job, guys. You learned nothing this weekend. Right there. We, we, hate, we hate this verse 
Luke 22, 33, when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We want to we just put that out of our Bible, don't we? Don't we just want, because then I don't have to pray. Jesus is praying for the very people that have just mutilated him and hung him on a cross to die, and he prays for them. If Jesus can do it on the cross, then you can get over that friend of yours that's annoying you on social media, and you can pray for them. Oh, but Jesus, Jesus, he, he, he threw the tables over in the temple. He, he whipped people. That's the Jesus I want to follow, not the one. But Jesus, I can do that too. Oh, my candidate lost. Whoa, whoa. Jesus did it. Yes, he did. But do you know every table that he turned over and every person, I don't know if he whipped the people, but let's just say he did because it's there. He, every person that may have been whipped in the temple that day, every Pharisee that Jesus called a snake, every person that Jesus encountered in his maybe angered state, he died for. He died for. Every time you get online and you sprout your opinion online, like your opinion is the only one that matters, and then you try and somehow bring Christ into it, just remember, Jesus died for the very people that spat at him, that defamed his father's house, the guys that were casting lots and gambling over, over his personal effects while he's on the cross. And yet he still looked up to heaven and said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I don't know if there's a harder thing for us to do in our Christian walk than this. I don't know. To forgive someone that so angers us, let me, let me just say this. Forgiveness doesn't mean just you wipe everything clean. As in, like, I can forgive you for hurting me, but I can still put up boundaries to make sure I don't get hurt again. I'm not asking you to, to just wipe everything clean, but I'm asking you to follow the example of Jesus. Back in the day well, when I was a young man, uh, they've made a resurgence now, but they we used to have these bands uh, with WWJD, on them, right? They're super cool. They've come back recently, like everyone's wearing them again, right? WWJT, what would Jesus do, right? And people would wear these bands and they'd get up and they, they'd put on these bracelets, WWJT. I never did it. I never, ever worn it. You know why? I knew what Jesus would do and I knew I would do the exact opposite of what Jesus would do and I didn't want to be faced with the constant shame of choosing the opposite. Now I would gladly wear it. I'm gonna give it to my children as well. What would James do? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's actually a great little thing to wear on your arm. Could I encourage you that right now in the middle of this very, very tense season in our nation, that before you say something, before you do something, before you react to someone or to something, could you maybe just think of those four little words? What would Jesus do? If the person you did not want to win won, then get on your knees and pray for them. Don't speak death over them. Don't speak death over our nation. Speak life and pray to God to do a miracle. 
if God can turn Saul into Paul in one night, if God can take me from who I was as a teenager to who I am today, if God can deal with you and your mess, then God can save anyone. God can do it again with the same passion that you campaigned and the same vigor that you shouted and sang your songs for your candidate. Could you take that same passion and pray for our nation and pray for our new leaders? God knows they need it. Kidding me? You know how hard it is to run a nation? Whether you do it the right way or the wrong way, it's still hard. We need to pray. We need to be like Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, therefore, as God's chosen people. So again, we're talking about Christians here. If you call yourself a Christian, not just a church attender. I know we've got people that just come to church just because their mama dragged them or something. That's okay. But if you actually say, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christ follower, th then here, ready? Holy and dearly loved. This is what we're supposed to do. Clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Bear with one another. And forgive them the way that the Lord forgave you. You know how I found why some Christians struggle to forgive people? It's because either deliberately or, or not deliberately, and they need a revelation, but most of the time it's deliberate, is that they deliberately choose to not put the weight and the value upon Jesus forgiving them. Because when we understand what Christ did for us, you and I, you and I deserve hell. We do. We deserve eternity away. The thoughts that you have, the thoughts that I've thought, the things I've done, the things you've done, we deserve hell. And it's only by the grace of Jesus, only by his sacrificial gift that he came to this earth and he died on the cross. It's only by his forgiveness he, that he didn't have to give us, but he chose to give. It's only by his forgiveness that we can now have eternal life. And for those people that struggle to forgive others, uh, what you're doing is you're not putting the weight and the value of what Jesus did for you. And even worse, you're expecting to receive something that you're not willing to give yourself. Clothe yourself. Clothe yourself. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. What, what if all of our attempts to show love and make peace with those we disagree with, it brings nothing but strife. What if your family legitimately is toxic? What if it is crazy and you've tried everything? Well, at the end of the day, we can never control how people will respond to us. We can only control how we choose to treat people. Ephesians chapter four, verse 31, it says this, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Forgive. I believe in this country. I love this nation with all my heart. The color of my skin does not determine the love I have for this country. And if I can get my way in the next couple of years, I'll end up getting a passport and I'll be able to vote with y'all in six years' time. Then we'll really have a good sermon that weekend. <laughs> I love our nation. Is our nation flawed? Absolutely. Are there evil people at play within our nation? Absolutely. Are we corrupt in many areas? Absolutely. But I have hope. Do you know why I have hope? Because of the church of Jesus Christ. You know, this weekend, we had our men's camp. There was people at our men's camp who voted for different sides. Yet, the entire men's camp 
we're so unified. You know why? Because we weren't unified around a candidate. We were unified around Jesus. We worshiped together. We prayed for one another. We played basketball with one another. We slid on water slides with one another. Politics didn't divide us on camp. Jesus united us. And for this nation to rise to become the pearl of the Orient once more, do you know who I think? I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to be because we vote in the right president. I think it's going to be because the church of Jesus Christ stands up and we walk in the authority that Christ has given us. If you're sitting here and you got a problem with politics this week, can I encourage you? Get into politics. I'm not afraid to talk about politics in our church. Get in. Make, be the change that you want to see. If you're angry at the corruption in our nation, stop paying the bribe to the policeman and thinking that that doesn't matter, because it does matter. If you're in business and you use the phrase, but this is how it's done, everyone's done it, congratulations on continuing the cycle and the circle of corruption. It takes one person to put their foot down and to say, I'm not doing this anymore, and another person to come along and say, I'm not doing this, and another person to come along. It's not easy to be in the minority. You don't understand, James, it's not easy. I, you're right, it is not easy. It's not easy to be a Christ follower. What, what about the book? What about the Bible has ever given you the false impression that it would be easy to follow Jesus? I was reading my devotions this morning, the book of Matthew, Jesus talking about how you will, you will come under fire for being a follower of me. Jesus didn't say, hey, follow me. Everything's going to be sweet. Sheesh. He didn't say that. <laughs> Jesus said, come follow me. This is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to pick up your cross every single day. People are going to hate you. Some of y'all, Jesus said, some of y'all are going to lose family members because of me. I love this country, and we're going to pray for this country. In just a moment, we're going to pray, and then we're going to worship, and we're not going to worship a candidate. We're going to worship Jesus, but we're going to pray for our incoming leadership. I've told you for the last six months of this campaign, whoever wins, we will pray for them that following Sunday. Whether you disagree with them or not, whether you disagree with that candidate or not, I don't care, they need our prayers. Whether your candidate won or not, I don't care, they need our prayers. So we're gonna pray. But before we do that, I wanna give every person here an opportunity to experience the forgiveness of God, like I just explained, to come into a relationship with Jesus, to accept his salvation that you haven't earned, you can't earn it, if you're thinking to yourself, I'm a terrible person, fantastic. You are a candidate for Jesus. The worse you are, even more of a candidate you are. Jesus died on this cross, but he, on the cross, but he rose three days later victorious for the forgiveness of our sins. And all we have to do, the Bible says, is come before him humbly, ask him to forgive us of our sins, confess that we believe that he is the risen son of God and we will be saved. We won't be perfect. We'll still have issues that we're dealing with, but now we have God living inside of us. And I want to give you that opportunity. Maybe you've never done this before. Maybe you're watching online or listening to our podcast. You've never done this before. Or maybe you did this a long time ago, but you walked away from God. Right now, you don't have an active relationship with Jesus. I want to encourage you. Today's the day. Come to Christ. Could everyone just bow your heads, close your eyes in the room? If you're online, I want you to join with us as well. Do this. I'm going to ask you on the count of three that if you don't know Jesus, or maybe you did a long time ago, but you walked away, on the count of three, I want you to lift up your hand nice and high because I want to pray for you. And if you're online, I want you to do the same thing. We'll pray for you where you are. So on the count of three, James, I've never done this before, or I did this a long time ago, but I walked away from Jesus. If that's you, you lift your hands. One, two, three, right now, all over this room. Awesome. Hands up here in the middle. Thank you, Jesus. Hands over here on the side. Up here in the back corner. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. If you're online, you can type in the chat, hey, this is me, or, or you can just raise your hand in your bedroom, wherever you're watching from. I want to pray for you right now. If you lifted your hand, can you put your hand on your heart? 
and we're all going to pray this prayer together today. But especially those with your hand on your heart, I want you to really mean these words. Repeat them after me today. Say this. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, come to you right now, and I ask you to forgive my sin. I believe that you died on the cross, but you defeated the grave, and you rose victorious. Right now I ask, please come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise for every person that just prayed that prayer? If you prayed that prayer, listen, that's not the end of your journey. That's the beginning of your journey. And we want to help you in that journey and walk with you. And so uh, one, of our, uh, one of our team would have seen you put up your hands. They're going to come and talk to you afterwards. And we'd just love to... Uh, you know, come alongside of you in your journey with Jesus. If you're online, please let us know. You can text the number, scan the QR code that's on the screen right now, whatever you need to do. Uh, but we'd love to connect with you. Amen. You good? Are you ready to pray? Can you stand? Come on, just for a moment, let's sing. Oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name. Of the Lord our God, oh praise His name forevermore, for endless days we will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord. Okay, we're gonna pray. Whether you are a Filipino or whether you're a foreigner living here. We need to stand together and we need to pray for our nation. And we need to pray for our incoming government of the next six years. And we need to continue to stand against corruption. That evil would be exposed where it is. That light would shine on darkness where it is. And that as a nation that we could prosper in this next season. That God would change the heart of those that need to be changed, everything. So we're gonna pray. So if you love this country, even if you're heartbroken or if you're happy, Whichever one you are, can you join with me as we pray for our great nation? Isn't it amazing? I don't know about you, but as, as good or as bad as this week has been for you, I'm glad the blue's on the top. Can we be thankful for that? I'm glad the blue's on the top. Come on, let's pray. Jesus, we need you. Our church, our families, God, this nation needs you. Lord, it feels like there's such division in our nation right now. God, I just pray that your spirit would come. God, families that are going through hard times, that your spirit of peace would come and it would bring families together. Lord, it would bring people together. Toxic culture that has arisen. God, we speak against it and we pray let peace come. Let peace come and let it guard hearts and let it guard minds. Lord, right now, we pray for our incoming president and our incoming vice president and the senators and the congressmen and women, God, the governors, the mayors, the counselors, the barangay captains, whoever it is, God, we pray that you would begin to speak to them. God, those that are Christians, that they would stand up full of the power of the Holy Spirit. Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for truth. Stand up for justice, God, for those that aren't Christians, for those that have even done evil things, we pray. Let them have a Saul to Paul encounter on the road of Damascus. We pray that they would encounter you, Jesus, supernaturally, Lord God. Even the evilest of hearts would be turned to you, Jesus. Oh, we thank you, God, that you would help give wisdom to our new president. Help give wisdom to our vice president, that they would lean with wisdom, put the right people around them, take away the wrong people around them, Lord God. Surround them with Christ followers. Surround them with people that would stand up for truth and for justice. Oh, make a way where there seems to be no way. We thank you that you've got through your hand on this nation. And I stand, God, and I pray we call this nation up. We call it up. Poverty mindset to be destroyed in Jesus' name. Corruption to go. Oh, let the Filipino rise with the word of God in their mouth. We thank 
you for the economy to skyrocket. We thank you for more jobs. We thank you for healthy families, for men to stand up and lead families. Oh, but Jesus, most of all, we thank you for who you are, and we worship you. Come on, lift your voice and say it. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. If you follow Jesus, then let that be reflected in your behavior. Paul writes in the New Testament that we are no longer Jew or Greek, even male and female, but we are now believers in Christ. As much as I love this nation and this flag and what it represents, you know the, the eight shoots that come off the sun represents the eight provinces that stood up and against the uh, Spanish rebellion. And I love it. Some of y'all didn't even know that. Did you know the three stars represent the father, the son? No, they doesn't. <laughs> The red represents the blood of Jesus. The blue, Manny Pacquiao, no, uh, the Holy Spirit. Hey, it, I love this, I love this nation. But, but even more than I love this nation, I'm a, I'm a Jesus follower. And for those of you that are happy this week, I'm glad you're happy. But one man ain't gonna save you. For those of you that are sad, one man ain't gonna ruin you. There's only one man that can save you. And his name is Jesus. There's only one man that can unite us together. And his name is Jesus. And that's who we come around. So in our church, I really wanna, I really wanna commend you, church that I think that as a church, we've done a really good job in the last six months. It's gotten tense a couple times. I really wanna thank our leaders. Listen, from the bottom of my heart, uh, you know, if you just come to our church, you know, you can do whatever you want, but our leaders, I, at the beginning of the election race, I, I, uh, me and Albie sat together and we talked and, and we talked with our leaders and I really, really begged our leaders that don't allow this time to be a time of division, but let it be a time where we can unite around Christ. And I really wanna thank the leaders of Favor Church because I think that on the whole, they've just done an amazing job in being passionate about what they believe, but not letting it divide our church. Not letting it divide our church. And from here on in, can we unite around Jesus? Um, someone sent me the, the transcript of what uh, Ma'am Lenny uh, said last night in her speech. And it's actually really, it's actually really cool. It was a really humble, unifying speech that encouraged, you can go and read it yourself, encouraged the nation to, 
accept the vote and to move on and, and now the work begins. Can I encourage you, if you feel like all hope is lost, it's not. Start now. If you feel like all hope is gained, awesome. Do something with it. Whatever it is, let God unite us. Amen. How do I love someone that I disagree with? <laughs> it's not easy, but with Jesus, it's possible. Amen. Amen. Can you give God praise? He's a good God.